First of all, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, most people are terrified of snakes. I, for one, am terrified of even cats. Many would be happy or even completely unperturbed if tomorrow morning they wake up and read in the newspaper that every single snake in this country is dead. So my question to you is, how do you, the lover of snakes, get through to such people? And through the snakes, how do you let people know about the larger ecosystem? I try to be, um, let's say, logical about things. First of all, if we didn't have snakes, we'd be overrun by rats, for sure. As rats, rodents in general, are the snake's favorite food. So uh, that's sort of an easy explanation to give, but uh, on the other hand, it's a little bit more difficult to try to get people to learn how to avoid snakes and avoid getting bitten by snakes, especially in a country where we have literally 50,000 people dying of snake bite every year and many, many thousands more permanently injured by snakes. We're looking at a, a rather drastic, rather big problem here. And uh, there are several reasons for this, and, and these are all solvable reasons since snake bites are accidents and they are avoidable. But uh, getting all these messages to the right people out there in rural India is not an easy job. And we are a country steeped in a lot of misbeliefs, a lot of beliefs about snakes and about uh, uh, things that are almost religious in belief and, and, and stuff that it's a little bit awkward to try to say, no, you're, wh whatever your grandfather told you is a lie. And you don't say things like that. You have to do it in a much more diplomatic way and get it across to people that snakes, in fact, aren't after us. Snakes are, in fact, very frightened of us. And, uh, and they're there because, well, we've invited them home because we've invited rats home, and rats love us. I mean, we, we're the best thing that rats that ever occurred to rats. The amount of garbage we hand around, the crops that we grow are perfect for rodents as well. So uh, we've, we've created a rather strange ecology in India, really, and not only in India, in, in other similar countries where a lot of rice is grown, for example. And, uh, and I, I, I guess the best example would be to take someone into the forest to try to see a snake. People often say, don't go in the forest, it's very dangerous, there are a lot of snakes there. Just the opposite is true. It's don't go into the rice fields, that's where the snakes are. And snakes are very common in agriculture in India and they're very rare in the forest. You have a lot of different species in the forest, yes, but numbers of snakes are incredibly high in agricultural areas and that's where the danger is. And people, um, uh, from abroad particularly come here and say, well, why don't you wear shoes when you harvest rice? Well, just try that someday. I mean, it, it's not possible. Barefoot is the way to go. Uh, they're trying stuff in Burma, for example, where they've uh, started doing experiments with using uh, uh, various kinds of, um, of rubber gum boots sort of thing. Simple, inexpensive, but they are saving lives that way. So this, this is a possibility in India as well. Another problem is, for example, people, uh, one issue of snake bite that happens in India, which is really scary, is that a lot of people are bitten, sleeping in villages on the ground or on the floor of their huts, are bitten at night while they're asleep. And it, by a particular species of snake called the crate, which a lot of you are probably familiar with the name anyway. The crate is a very uh, innocuous type of snake. It's not one of these dramatic guys like the cobra who sits up and he doesn't hiss and make a lot of noise. It's a very quiet snake which eats rodents. It comes to people's houses for rodents. And it comes and perhaps crawls next to people while they're asleep. Uh, the movement of their hand, the smell of their skin, some stimulus makes them bite. And when they bite, it is not a painful bite, which is another insidious thing, really, because if it was painful, then immediately you'd react and go to a hospital and get treatment. When a crate bites, there's hardly any pain, and uh, you might wake up and say, well, I got bitten by something if you didn't see it, and perhaps the family would say, well, we'll check it out in the morning. Well, the problem is the morning may not arrive for that person because the crate venom is so toxic. So a simple thing like everyone sleeping on the ground, if they had a mosquito net, it would probably prevent that, not to mention dengue and malaria and all the rest of it. So there are simple solutions to these very, very serious problems, but getting this word out to the rural public is our biggest challenge probably right now.
So I'm going to come back to the uh, snake bite. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. But before that, um, your wife's book, Janaki's book, the first one, My Husband and Other Animals, and I have the second one here, which I haven't actually read as yet. Um, but the first one has this fantastic anecdote about you as a young boy in Kodai Canal with your pet python and how you used to take it back to your grandmother's house in Bombay, who you referred to, uh, you, who you called Amma Doodles. And um, she used to phone up, if, if somebody was going to come around, a pesky guest, she would say, oh great, come over and see my grandson, he's visiting with his snake. And somehow miraculously, uh, the guest had something else to do. Um, it then goes on to say how your snake ran away, or rather, crawled away, sorry, um, and you couldn't find him. So could you please recollect that particular uh, incident? Yeah. And also, did he have a name? And how did you, as a young boy, look carrying around this python on the streets, in the dorms, in your, in your hostel, or on the train? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, the lovely grandmother, my step-grandmother, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyaya, probably used that ruse more than once to, uh, to keep away unwanted visitors. She was always getting a lot of visitors, and uh, some of them never came back. Um, yeah, the snake did get away. I was staying in an uh, apartment in uh, Bombay uh, on Marine Drive, and uh, one day I looked in the box, and the glass had slid apart. So, uh, I, I really don't know how it got out, but snakes are that way. They, they're very tricky about that, and it was gone. So I had to go to every flat in the building, knock on the door and say, <laughs> my pet is missing. I was just wondering if you happened to see. <laughs> and of course, everyone said, oh, really? You know, and they were thinking, pussycat, puppy, something like that. <laughs> what is your pet? Uh, it's a, a python, not a very big one. It's a smallish python, about eight feet long. Well, you can imagine the reactions of various people. Okay, to make a long story short, I did get through the entire building, and eventually we did find the python who was hidden under one of the trunks in our storeroom, so thank goodness for that, because I can imagine the police being called, the fire department, or getting into all sorts of complications. The same thing, uh, a similar sort of thing happened on a train journey when I was with my sister coming from Kodi Canal back to Bombay. We were on a train, and... Uh, I was on one of the upper berths, and my sister was also, and she reached across and woke me up and pointed down, and I could see I had a sand boa which had gotten out of a bag. Well, it had actually crawled through the knot. Sand boas are that way, they're very strong, and its head was just sticking out. Luckily, no one else was awake, so I quickly jumped down, got it back inside, tied the knot, put it into a second bag, but you can imagine the consternation. I, there are several other stories like this, but we won't go on. I mean, it's <laughs> did did your python have a name? Uh, that particular python was Samson. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so this is a question, um, sort of what Seema had touched upon. But in many ways, we live in a land of contradictions. So we have a holy river, and yet we pollute it. We pray to the snake in many parts of this country, yet mm -hmm. we might not think of conservation around it as much as we would say or a pro uh, tiger or an elephant. But it, it's also snake stereotypes, which forever give the snake a bad reputation. So if you have Adam and Eve, Harry Potter, Indian politicians calling each other snakes, a whole lot of ways that people use it Negatively. in the wrong way. Yeah. So how do you adapt in India to the cultural context? Uh, you have spoken about this a bit, but I wonder if uh, social media sort of, have you seen something of late that um, you know, I, I've been seeing a lot of dramatic changes probably in the last six or eight years uh, about the attitude towards snakes. And I, I'll just take one particular example because it just happened last week. We were in Agumbe. You might have heard about Agumbe. It's the highest rainfall area in South India. It's where we set up our field station back in 2005. We're, we're doing a study on king cobras using radio telemetry there. And we've got a couple of trackers who are, they're just volunteers. They're very keen young guys who are interested in snakes. They've joined us. We've trained them how to use the radio antenna to follow the snakes around. We visited a house the other day, uh, where uh, a house in the middle of a large areca nut plantation, and they have a small coffee plantation, and then rice fields. 
And the king cobra that these, this tracker was following happened to be hunting around this farmhouse. So he had to go and uh, answer a phone call because his phone didn't work there at one of the uh, local stations. And he asked the lady of the house, she, he said, I'm really sorry, I have to leave you now. The, the snake is okay, it's not doing anything. I'll be back soon. The lady of the house said, don't worry, I'll watch the snake until you get back and everything will be okay. And he was kind of startled and came and called, called us actually and said, well, come on down and we're following the snake. And we went there and sure enough, the lady was there watching the snake very interestingly. And I don't speak Kannada very well, but through the interpreter with us, I said, so uh, how do you feel about it? And she said, no, it's okay. It's been around for the last two weeks here hunting. And yesterday we saw a cobra and we know that cobras eat cobras. And we're just hoping that King Cobra will eat that cobra. <laughs> and this was from a, a, a lady who is, you know, she, her, it's her first experience, a close experience with a King Cobra. She had seen them in the past, but never this close. And she was absolutely calm and okay about it. Similarly, on the same day, we found a, a female King Cobra lying on her nest. King Cobras are the only snake in the world out of the 3,000 odd species who actually make a beautiful mound nest to lay their eggs. And uh, this particular nest was 50 meters away from a household where there are two little girls, about seven or eight years old, and they were absolutely fascinated in seeing this female king cobra making her nest, gathering the leaves together, lying there on top of it. And uh, they are actually protecting the nest because a lot of other people came around and started wanting to bother the snake, throw stones at it and stuff like that. But the whole family is quite okay with it being there. They say, but please, when the babies hatch, kindly remove them. It's okay? We said, of course it's okay, we'll do that. But they're letting the eggs be and letting the uh, eggs incubate there. A, a marvelous change in attitude.